So I wanted to welcome all of you to the webinar today. We're doing a Coalition Building 101, How to Build and Sustain a Movement. Uh, my name is Mohit Nair. I'm the Partnerships Director for Fair Vote Washington. And so in short, my job entails sort of reaching out to partner organizations, uh, connecting over a wide range of issues that they're interested in, linking it back to these pivotal issues around democracy reform and ranked choice voting, and seeing how we can build a growing movement around Washington State. And I'm so fortunate because with me today is South King County Chapter Lead, Michelle Blanchard. Michelle, do you want to say a few words about yourself? Um, sure. Hi. Yeah, I'm uh, Michelle Blanchard. I'm the South King County Chapter Lead. Um, I got involved with Fair Vote about a year ago, um, mostly looking for a way to um, kind of uh, figure out what to do about all this divisiveness in politics. And I really liked um, the whole system approach of Fair Vote. Um, and I started out actually by going to a Pierce County meeting and wishing that there was something closer. Uh, to me, and then um, ran into <laughs> Kathy Allen, who said, well, do you want to start something up? <laughs> and here I am today. So um, thr I'm thrilled to be here today uh, and presenting with Mo Hit. Um, I'm really excited uh, for us to work together to get more people um, on board, uh, more people and organizations on board to um, support ranked choice voting. Um, like Mo Hit was just saying, I really think this is, um, this is a great time to be working on this because I think ranked choice voting just addresses so many issues um, that are in the news today. So anyway, glad to be here. Thanks, Michelle. And I see a lot of folks have joined us. Um, Trenton and Harriet and Carol have already introduced themselves in the chat. If you haven't done so already, please feel free to tell us where you're from, uh, what you're looking forward to, what brings you here today. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, and let's let's get started. Before we begin, a, a few quick moments of sort of housekeeping uh, in terms of what we're expecting with the webinar. Uh, if you have a question throughout the webinar, feel free either to unmute yourselves and directly ask a question at any point. This is for you, and we're trying to make this as interactive as possible. Um, or you could always use the Zoom Q&A function and sort of pop a question in there. I'll also be monitoring the chat periodically. Uh, so those are sort of some, some uh, avenues available for that. We also request that you do have a pen and paper available because this is intended as an interactive workshop. We'll be asking you to brainstorm certain, um, certain pitches. We'll be asking you to be really thinking about the kinds of uh, mapping your social circles and thinking about partner organizations in your circles. So a pen and paper would definitely help out. Michelle, what, where are we headed with this? All right, well, our objectives today, um, we have a few of them, and I've got too many windows open. <laughs> there we go. Um, so today's objectives are first, uh, to understand the benefits of working in a coalition and how coalition building happens, and Mohit will be covering that, and telling you a little bit um, about our, or his, our coalition. Um, and then we're gonna be moving on to um, thinking about how we can look at our social circles to find connections um, to organizations that might partner well with Fair Vote, uh, and I'll be working on that with you. Um, and then also help, hopefully helping you feel like you have the tools and kind of know what to say to reach out to those organizations. And then finally, uh, we'll finish by working on um, just ways of communicating what ranked choice voting means to all those different um, organizations and people that, that we identify. Thanks, Michelle. I just want to acknowledge Joan, who just joined us. She says she's new to Fair Vote Washington, but she's lived here for almost 40 years and knows quite a few folks, almost all of whom would be interested in this effort. And that's as good a place as any to start talking about coalition building, because that's exactly what we're trying to do. So for starters, what is a coalition? You know, it's a word that we kind of intuitively know, but what do we mean by a coalition in the context of organizing and in the context of building the power of community? Well, at its core, a coalition is just a diverse group of individuals and organizations who work together to reach a common goal. How you go about establishing that goal is critical. Uh, what the coalition seeks to achieve is critical, but that's what it is at the end of the day. It can have an informal structure. It can have a formal structure. It can be top down and led by a steering committee. It can be very sort of diffuse where all the participants have equal say. There's, there's many different ways to go about it, but at the end of the day, it's a group of people coming together, working to create actionable change. So let's look at why we should start a coalition. We all know that here at Fair Vote Washington, we're trying to bring ranked choice voting to Washington state. We're trying to promote equitable and fair representation. Why can't we just do, do that through the legislative route? Well, a coalition is super critical when it comes to pooling resources, thinking about community-wide initiatives, and really looking at developing and using political clout. When you go and talk to a representative, many times in Olympia, they'll ask you, well, who else cares about this? You know, my constituents are the labor community, and it's the uh, Native American community, and it's the, you know, East King County community. 
what are, what are they saying about this issue? You need to have a real good sense of who's actually behind the effort. Is it really a narrow group of supporters? And sure, we can say we have 6,000 plus supporters here in Fairville, Washington, but what about our partner organizations? Who are we working in coalition with? So even if we look at just the legislative route alone, these legislators care a lot about who's part of our coalition. So that's one reason. We also wanna increase communication between groups. There's a lot of partners that are working on a diverse array of issues. We wanna leverage strength and diversity in numbers, build sustainable relationships. It's clear that no one issue sort of just happens overnight, right? There's no, whether you look at all of the major reforms that have come in Washington and even nationwide, it's taken months, if not years of effort uh, on the part of several community-based organizations pushing just the way Fair Vote Washington has been pushing. And right now, as I look around, there's so many groups that are working on racial justice, on immigrant rights, on climate change, all of these groups care about how our, our government functions and we have to sort of tie this issue of, um, of ranked choice voting and electoral reform to the issues that each of the groups cares about. And so that's what we're gonna be looking at today. So who should be part of a coalition? Well, if you think about this, at, at, at its core, there's stakeholders, critical stakeholders like you know, Fair Vote Washington, who has a, who's, who's very invested in bringing ranked choice voting to Washington state, but there's also community opinion leaders. There's policymakers. There could be legislators who are part of a coalition. It could be community-based organizations. It could be labor unions. It could be, again, just individuals. Somebody who runs the Washington Census Alliance may be a really critical stakeholder here who you might want to invite. So it's you need to think about you know, who you want to invite, who has influence, who has a stake in the game, and who might be interested in this effort. How might it tie, tie to the issues that they care about? These are the kinds of folks who are, who are looking to invite as part of a diverse coalition of stakeholders. As we look to build a coalition, we've actually just launched a brand new coalition called Washington for Equitable Representation. What this is, it's a multiracial, multi-generational coalition that looks to center the idea of equity and equitable representation. And the idea is simple. It's that for too long, the status quo has not been working. It's not been working for uh, communities of color. It's not been working for folks who have been seeking meaningful representation in elected office. Uh, nowhere around uh, Olympia or even King County do we see the kind of representation that we see in the, the diversity of the electorate. We want you know, communities of color to be able to elect their candidates of choice. We want to get rid of pernicious problems like vote splitting. We don't want you know, people to say that they wasted their vote on a candidate who dropped out before the March 10th deadline. And so you know, their ballot did not count. We don't want any of these problems in our democracy. And all of these issues link back to the critical issues that our partners care about. So that's what this coalition is all about. Right now, in our diverse coalition, we have groups uh, as diverse as the Urban League of Metropolitan Seattle. We have faith-based communities like uh, Muslim Community and Neighborhood Association. We have APACE. We have uh, the Coalition of Immigrants, Refugees, and Communities of Color. Uh, and then we have the Asian Council and Referral Services. I could go on and on and on. And we've done several more board presentations where groups are just looking to come on board and join this effort. And I will say in many of these cases, these conversations have taken a long time, but this is really the pivotal moment where folks are connecting the dots between the issues that they care about and the power of building community and coalition and working in concert with one another to, to, to create change in an actionable sort of in a rep representative democracy. Now, what do we ask these coalition members? Well, when we invite them to join the coalition, there's different levels at which they can get involved, right? At a basic level, we say, can we authorize the use of your name in our campaign materials? That's important because when we go and talk to those legislators, they always ask us, again, who's part of your coalition? Who's behind this? Who supports this? What does the Urban League think about it? So we need to say, okay, well, here's the kind of support that we have. You can ask them to be spokespeople for the campaign when you do run an actual campaign. This could be a ballot initiative as well. Uh, you can invite them to write letters to the editor or op-eds, which many of you fantastic you know, volunteers have already done. We wanted to sort of co-write letters to the editor with our partner organizations as well. Again, linking back to some of the issues that they care about. And then of course, the idea is to build the capacity for a statewide ballot initiative in 2022. And the idea is that that kind of heavy lift will not happen alone. Even with a, 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 a you know, broad volunteer base like we have, it's not possible to do everything on our own. And so we need to work with our partner organizations toward that effort. So let's look before we begin at how we even begin to talk about ranked choice voting. Let's say you've come across someone and the very first thing you need to think about is have they heard about ranked choice voting before? So I want you to take a few minutes right now and just think if you came across someone who's never heard about ranked choice voting before, what would you say to them? How would you describe what ranked choice voting is? Just take a few seconds to think about that. And then this is where you, would, uh, you should get out your pen and paper and, and jot some notes down because I'm going to ask on folks to share, uh, share some examples. And in a second here, I will also give you an example of what we have, and then you can compare that to what you have.
So as folks are thinking about that, Michelle, let's queue it up and let's see. So ranked choice voting is a simple way to improve the way in which we vote. Instead of choosing one candidate, you simply rank your favorite candidates, first, second, third, and so on. So with that, this is a very simple explanation. What I like about it is it, it gets right to the point and it says, what is ranked choice voting? And then it says, you know, how, how does it work at a very basic level? What do, what do um, if I'm a voter and I see my ballot, what do I need to do? Instead of choosing one, I rank my different candidates. So having seen this, take a few minutes and just try to develop your own pitch. Imagine that you're at a, um, at a farmer's market and you've just come across someone and you want to explain what ranked choice voting is. Or you've gone to, uh, gone to your church congregation or your faith-based community and you're just talking to somebody and you're saying, you know, this is what I'm working on these days. And they ask, well, what is that? How are you going to explain it to them? So take a few minutes um, and develop this at your own time. And when you're ready, I'm going to ask that you paste it into the chat or even unmute yourself and share an example. And I know some of you have been here and, and seen sort of Cassie's great uh, advocacy webinars and the RCV 101. So let me call on a few folks. Would anyone be willing to share an example of what they use to explain what ranked choice voting is? At this point, I think everyone should be allowed to talk. So feel free to unmute yourself and just volunteer. I, I could do it if you want. Yeah, please go for it, Stoney. So ranked choice voting is a way of conducting elections um, where you can vote for more than one candidate and you rank your choices. Uh, and then if your uh, first choice doesn't do very well, your ballot get your your vote gets transferred to your second choice. So you don't lose your vote just for, for voting uh, for someone that you really like. Great. Exactly. I mean, that's that's exactly the idea we're going for. And it, and it connects to this uh, thing that, that Carol just dropped in the chat. You'll be able to vote for who you want. Many times, voters have to vote strategically. Uh, they have to think about, well, you know, I really want X candidate, but they don't have a shot at winning. So I'll pick between the lesser of two evils, evils and go with Y. The one thing I would encourage you is as you look to develop your pitch, remember that simple is better. And so sometimes we can get into this tendency of wanting to answer every question even before it's been asked. You want to draw intrigue. You want to be able to sort of give a very basic easy, easily understandable pitch that explains what RCV is and not get into too much detail until you have a deeper conversation. All of those examples are really good that people have, uh, have come up with. So let's get into how we go about actually talking to folks and building our coalition. Great, thanks Mohit. So um, at this point, um, now that you kind of have a sense of um, coalition building and um, what um, our coalition uh, looks like, and we've, we've got that beginning of the pitch. We are gonna use that in just a little bit, um, but right now we're gonna do the part where we really take a look at our social circle. And, um, and like Mohit said at the beginning, um, just uh, we're gonna be kind of walking through some different parts. You'll, if you have the our ability to, um, I'll be having you uh, click on a link or two that'll be put in the chat. And so just, if you can do that, um, I know a lot of times when I do webinars, I'm kind of like, oh, I'm just gonna sit and watch, but, um, I think the more that you're engaged with it, the more uh, you'll be able to get out of it. So, um, so when we go uh, looking to reach out to different organizations, there's kind of three parts of the process. First is identify, figuring out who we are, um, are connected to and who we can talk to, um, and then educating. Uh, that's where that little bit of the pitch that you've already started is and kind of helping um, people connect ranked choice voting with what they their mission is and then finally activating and, and getting some action from that um, and our first step being identify and so the uh, first thing you want to do is be able to identify people in your circle of friends uh, who belong to an organization um, learn about their interests and identify the mission of their organization so just to get us started, I'm just gonna have you take a minute or two to think, and it just kind of gets your brain going and thinking through um, the people that you know. Um, and my first question for you is just, do, do my friends and family know about my work with Ranked Choice Voting? And it's just kind of funny when I thought about that, I came up with people that I was like, not everybody does. Um, so thinking about those people, um, just asking yourself, am I a member of a political, community-based, faith-based, or issue-based organization? And just being really flexible and thinking about organizations um, because so there's so many people um, could really benefit from, or organizations could benefit from ranked choice voting. Um, do I know anyone who's a part of any of these organizations? 
and then what's my relationship with these members and would they um, be willing to meet with me? You're just kind of thinking through to kind of gear up for our next slide. So what we're going to be doing is mapping out the people you know, and here's where that uh, pen and paper, or maybe you're, you've got another window open and you're, you're more of a type, a typer, <laughs> typist. Um, and we want to be thinking through the people we know. So just starting with that first tier is, you know, who do you interact with on a daily basis? Who are your friends and acquaintances and I should have said and family? Um, who can you call or text at a moment's notice? So right now you're just jotting names down. You're not worried about what they're connected with. And then when you've kind of exhausted the list here, moving on to your second tier. So just next in order, um, who are some people you know less well? Maybe people you'd feel comfortable emailing or texting, but maybe not quite those urgent everyday people. And then finally, the third tier are might be people you met at a party or an event, um, a coworker could fall actually anywhere within here, or maybe there's some local organizations and you just know well enough uh, that organization that there's someone you'd feel comfortable emailing, or you have enough of a connection um, that you feel like you might be a good person to reach out to them. I'm just gonna give you another few seconds here to keep jotting. And if you have more uh, than I've just given you time for, by all means, keep writing. So the next thing we're going to be doing in, in a minute is looking through that list and connecting those people with organizations. And I just, um, a lot of times people are like, well, what kind of organization? And I think um, the biggest thing I want you to do is, is, is think broadly here. So it could be faith-based groups, um, could be unions, um, issue-based groups like an environmental group or animal rights group, um, any kind of a community group or neighborhood association. And one thing that might, uh, that would be useful, I think, is um, to take a look at this link. I saw the chat flash, so I'm thinking Mohit maybe just put it in there. He's going to put it in the chat if he hasn't yet. Um, and this is a list of all the organizations and associations in Washington State. And so one thing that can just be helpful as a memory jog, and, and even when we get to the next slide, you might find it useful, is just being able to scroll through because what will happen is there will be organizations you're a part of or that you know people who are a part of that you just haven't even thought of um, until you see it and you go, oh, oh yeah, you know, I know my neighbor is a part of that organization. And so it's, it's just a, a useful way of um, bringing organizations to mind that you might not have thought of otherwise. So if you can open that up, that's great. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start with those first tier people moving down to the second and the third and mostly because just of your comfort level and the ease of being able to make connections with those people. And what I'm going to ask you to do is next to those names, jot down which organizations are represented on this list. And by the way, don't forget to include the ones you're a part of. So if you haven't written those down, I would put those right at the top. And also thinking about who do they know at other organizations. So maybe my neighbor's husband, maybe I don't, or my neighbor, I probably do, but <laughs> my friend's husband, um, maybe uh, he is a part of a union um, or a part of another organization or a friend of a friend. And then I'm going to give you a minute to do this, um, but if you have Kind of already gone through your list and you're jotting all these down and you have a little time just be thinking about their values and priorities um, that'll fit in with the next thing we do so i'm just going to give us a minute And if you have any questions as you're doing this, um, by all means, feel free to unmute or um, put those questions, I guess, in the chat or the Q&A. Mohit can see them in the Q&A. Yeah, absolutely, at any point.
All right, so I think I'm going to move on. Um, and again, just like with the other, if you still have ideas, you can keep writing. So the, the next thing that I'm going to ask you to do is choose one to focus on. And I think you're kind of thinking about the, um, the tiers, um, but you're also thinking about which one could have a mutually beneficial relationship with Fair Vote Washington. And again, I kind of contend that a lot of organizations could have a mutually beneficial relationship with Fair Vote Washington. Um, you know, any organization that would benefit from more equitable representation would benefit from right choice voting. Um, any organization that's working on a public health or community issue that might benefit from um, a more collaborative uh, process would benefit. Um, I don't know. I, I can't think of a whole lot that wouldn't in some ways if they have any kind of a legislative agenda in, in particular. So, um, but be thinking of ones that you feel like would fit and to help you decide, you can also think about what do you know about this organization because some will feel like more of a natural fit than others. Um, how does their work relate to my work around ranked choice voting? And who would I be most comfortable reaching out to? Especially if this is something that's new to you, you know, starting with the, the one that feels a little easier, it's always a great first, um, first step. And when you have chosen one, I'm going to ask if you have the ability to go to um, a site called Padlet. I'm going to click on it right now and then Mohit will drop it in the um, chat. So I just I'll show you how it works. Let us know if you have trouble accessing that at all. Hopefully mine will load. I'm not getting, Ooh. oh, there we go. Phew. There we go. So if once you're on Padlet, it will look like this. There's a plus sign at the bottom. You just click it and you will see a little, like a little post-it note. And all right now I want you to do is go to the title part and you're just going to put in the name of your organization that you chose. If it is one, if you're comfortable and you are willing to put your name as well in parentheses, that is really helpful. When we did this with our chapter, I know it was really helpful for Mohit to know which organizations people were connected to. And that is all I'm asking you to do right now. And then you need to click outside of it and it will post it up there. Um, and if you are in it and you thought, oh, I wanted to, you know, I didn't put my name or I meant to do something different. You can always click. We'll actually be coming back to it soon, but you can click the little button and then edit and then get back into it. Um, and the other thing just to know about Padlet is as if as more people put names in, um, a lot of times it shifts it down. So you are welcome to grab yours and move it up to the top so that it's visible here. Um, and the other thing that I'm going to suggest too is that if you are not positive about an organization or you're not sure, I'd say better put it, I mean, it, there's no harm in putting it up here. Um, or just pick one from that list that you, maybe one you know about in your community, um, just to practice this, this exercise with. I'm going to put a couple up here just to have some um, to use as examples. So like I'm a teacher, so Washington, Education Association, yep, Association. Um, that one would work. Oh. I'll give another minute or two and hopefully we can get a couple more up here. Oops. Oh. Right underneath. There we go. So I just realized these are going to get bigger, so I better spread them out. And you're welcome to put more than one. Joan is saying the plus sign is not responding to her click. You know what, Joan? Uh. You, could, you could message me on chat and, and tell me what your organization is or, or unmute yourself and we can add that on your behalf. We'd love to hear from you in any case. Yeah. Sometimes technology can be super frustrating. Yep. Oops, I'll move my... Over there. Great. Lots of great examples up here. 
Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to move away. I'm going to navigate away from this page, but by all means, if you are still adding things, you can add them. And I notice as some of them are hiding behind each other. So you are welcome to drag your own or I'll drag it if I notice that they're in some funny places once we get back to it again. But for now, I'm going to close this out and move to the next, um, next slide. So um, we've identified an organization. And the next part of identifying an organization is really thinking about the mission of the organization. So the next thing I'm going to ask you to do is to take a minute to look up the mission or the legislative page of the organization that you chose. Um, because I found the legislative page actually to be sometimes more helpful um, or just as helpful as the mission page. Um, and you want to find a piece that connects well with Fair Vote Washington's mission. And you'll add it to your note on the Padlet. And so what you'll do is you'll just click right back to that Padlet page. And one thing that's really nice is if you have um, something up, um, oops, I'm being slow today. So I just grabbed um, the WEA's um, legislative priorities ahead of time, just because I knew I was doing this. Um, but you can just copy. And then I'm going to go back to my Padlet. I'm going to open it up. And I am just going to paste that right in. Woo, it made it long. I'm going to have to move some things around. <laughs> but um, and that's just their first uh, thing on their legislative agenda, promoting equity, combat racism, and eliminate discrimination. So I'm going to slide mine out of here over here. So they are going to stretch. They're going to move around. If yours is hidden behind someone else's, I'm going to try to fix this again. There we go. Ooh, I like it. It's got purple. Um, so anyway, uh, that is your next step, and I'll give you a minute to do that. And if you need help with any of it, let me know if there's a question about how to Access it. I find this to be super useful. Many times we're connected to all these organizations and we haven't really taken the time to dig deep into their mission statements or vision statements. It can be very inspiring. So I really Sonia, appreciate it. I'm going to move you around a little bit. Oops. Trying to manage. Hopefully not really. Okay, I hope I didn't just do something. Oh, I bet he's still taking. He's moved it. I know it takes a minute to look it up and copy it and paste it in. I'll give another minute or two. And then, like I said, like before, I'll just move on and assume that you'll get it done um, just as you have time. Oh, there we go. Something happening in the. Oh, I see Joan's got all sorts of great ideas. Wow. I'll start adding some of these to the Padlet. Yeah, fantastic. All right, so I think I'll move on. Let me, um, I've got too many windows again. <laughs> I'm going to close my Padlet and move to the slideshow. Hmm. So now that you hopefully, at least even if you don't have it in the Padlet yet, you had a chance at least to find or look at um, the mission or the, the legislative um, page um, and found something that connects. Um, now you can kind of make some of those connections. Let me see. So what you want to do is think about how does ranked choice voting relate to the mission and areas of interest and hopefully you already were thinking about this, but now you're really looking a little deeper into what that organization has as their priorities. And then just asking how can a more representative and functional democracy impact their area of work. And so um, 
like I was looking at, mine was the WEA, um, the Education Association, and um, they were indicating on theirs that they support legislation that promote equity, eliminate discrimination, and combats racism in our schools. That was what they said. And so something I feel like I could say to them or, or a way it connects is that to me, I kind of feel like that kind of legislation would be more likely to be introduced and passed by legislators who are um, who actually represent um, uh, people <laughs> um, and that are elected in a more equitable system like ranked choice voting. So um, I feel like that's just one of a variety of ways that I could, um, a connection that I could make with them um, for why that works. And so um, take a look at that mission. Think about that connection. This might be useful for you to jot down. We're not going to put it on the Padlet, but just take a second to think about um, what you would say now looking at their mission. Because that um, is going to then fit right into our next step, which is educate. And for educate, we're just thinking about if we set up an initial meeting or have that conversation, you know, that's when we want to educate um, the person about your work in ranked choice voting, thinking about why does it matter to you um, and why does it matter to them? Uh, how does it relate to their area of interest? Um, how can a more representative and functional democracy impact their area of work? So that's just what it said on the last slide. So you, you are now um, connecting those things. That's right. And so, you yeah. As you think about this, I really want you to think about it, you know, from a personal level. Think about the times in which you, you've met individuals from these organizations, right? I'll, I'll share a personal narrative here because I moved to Seattle from Mumbai in October, not knowing anybody um, except my wife who's here. So what I did in order to build these connections was literally attend all these town halls that I could in, a, in the pre-pandemic era um, and really just go to all these events. There was a, an event that was hosted by, I believe the Sightline Institute, uh, where both Lisa and I showed up and we got to meet a lot of folks. Sometimes events weren't directly related to our line of work, but you got to meet really cool people and, and sort of understand what they're doing and what, what really matters to them. And the key there is active listening, right? It's, it's really about authentically listening about what matters to them and what, what really drives them at the end of the day, because you're all here because you're really passionate about ranked choice voting. Turns out, I'm sure that they have their own areas that they're super passionate about. And there is a natural area that where we can sort of find mutual ground. So let's look at an example again. If you look at, let's say you're, you're at one of these meetings and you come across uh, someone from a labor union. Well, if you talk to somebody who's from a labor union, can you think about how you may go about talking to that particular union member? Take a few minutes again to just jot down on your notebook um, what, how you would go about talking to a union member about ranked choice voting, but also just more broadly drawing that connection between ranked choice voting and their line of work. How would you go about doing that? In a few seconds, I'll show an example, but I want you to start thinking about it. Some questions to consider as you think about this again what are what are union members what are they fighting for what what matters to them usually union members understand the power of coalition building quite well and then coming to that fundamental question of how ranked choice voting relates let's go ahead and show the example michelle so this is what we came up with. And this is my own personal perspective, right? So if you look at one example from someone from Unite Here Local 8, hey, I'm so glad to hear that you're part of Unite Here Local 8. How are you adapting your work in fighting for living wages and job security in this uncertain time? And this is where you'd invite them to tell you more about their efforts. There really isn't sort of stock footage or like a script that I can give you to go about this work because it is about genuinely making connections. It's about wanting to be interested in the kind of work that they're doing. So really, even if you don't know anything about their work, if you haven't like researched it ahead of time, that's no problem. This is your opportunity to listen um, and, and really build that connection. Then you can go into saying, I know unions are very important for workers to have a voice in negotiations with powerful interests. One of the things I've been working hard on is improving the way we vote. So vulnerable residents in unions like Unite Your Local 8 have a better opportunity to elect representatives who care about their needs. Have you heard about ranked choice voting and proportional representation? So you can see how this evolves. The first part of it is really focused on trying to understand what the mission is of the organization uh, with the person you're talking to. And then you think about, okay, well, what is it that they're trying to accomplish? 
And then you come back to linking it to the kind of work that you do and telling them about the work that you do. Uh, and it's all about sort of, sort of building that meaningful connection. Uh, Joan says, the education step is why I'm here. I need to deepen my understanding in order to feel the inevitable questions. I couldn't agree more. Uh, does anybody have any examples of a pitch that you might like to give uh, to a union member? Uh, you can unmute yourself again and just share an example if you feel comfortable with that. Uh, or alternatively, drop, drop it in the chat. Let's give it 30 seconds or so. I see a lot of people who meet a lot of people. I know that Trenton, Stoney, Joan, Harriet, Robert. Okay, well, if not, I'm gonna welcome you to drop that in the chat at any point. I'm really curious to learn how you go about building that connection with folks. So let's move on and think about this next stage. You've already identified the folks that you're gonna to talk to. You focused on the education piece, which Joan has already mentioned is super critical. It's why we're all here. And now you're gonna focus on the activation piece, which means you're gonna look at how do you actually talk to them and how do you actually make that ask? Uh, you have to ask to see if they're comfortable inviting your team for a presentation or uh, joining the coalition. It really depends on where they're at. You need to look at how you're gonna actually reach out to them. And this is a great stage to involve me in the process. Why? Because in many cases, I have a full spreadsheet of organizations we've already connected to. We wanna make sure that let's say it's an organization like, um, um, you know, Islamic Center of Olympia or, or, a, or a board of, you know, the library board or something that I saw in the, in the Padlet. If it's any kind of organization like that, well, maybe we've already connected with them. Maybe there's already been a point of contact. Maybe Lisa's given a presentation or Michelle's given a presentation. If that's already happened, we want to make sure that we're coordinating our efforts and they're aware that, hey, you are another volunteer as part of our diverse array and our, and our group who wants to reach out. Then once you make that connection and sort of have me, keep me in the loop, we can brainstorm how to involve them and figure out what the best ask is. In some cases it might be, hey, do you wanna invite us to present? And in that case, I'd be happy to include you in that presentation too. It'd be nice to sort of jointly do a presentation like that together. It might be that we're actually further ahead in our relationship with the, with the particular organization or the person. In that case, we might say, guess what? We just launched a new coalition, the Washington for Equitable Representation Coalition. I have several documents that I already have designed. We have a website under design right now. So we could invite them to see some of those documents and sort of send them those materials. It really depends on what level our relationship is at with that particular organization. So once you've identified and you've worked on the education piece, that's a natural step where you could loop me into the process, either CC me in the email or better yet, reach out to me first and we can brainstorm what's the best way to engage with this organization. I'll give one more example. Um, Trenton has been working very hard in Spokane to connect with a lot of different groups. We've both individually worked with the NAACP and several other groups in the area. And it turns out that just happened to connect uh, along the same lines. And now we're jointly giving a presentation on, I believe the 19th or 20th of August to the Spokane Coalition of Color. That's the NAACP the Asian Pacific Islander Coalition and one other group. Um, it's a, it's a faith-based faith -based community. Um, so that's, that's what can happen when you sort of work together in, in, this, uh, in this way. So uh, at this point, um, I'm just gonna ask you to uh, just set a goal for what your next step is going to be. Um, it could be to reaching out to the organizations you listed, um, or a different one if, if that feels better. And if you are comfortable, it would be great if you could type it in the chat because um, by simple, it, it really helps you actually um, achieve it. Um, so if you have some, I'm trying to pull the chat up right now, um, but it would be nice to know, I, I think, um, Mohit, I think, has mentioned on this call, um, this can take some time. Um, so a lot of times there's just small little steps along the way. So maybe it's just, maybe it's the person you're thinking of doesn't even know that you do anything with frank choice voting. Like I said, you know, you think about those people that you go, wait a minute, I don't know if they know that. Um, so maybe that's your first step is just um, reaching out and letting them know and, and looking for um, the commonality that you have um, and, and why it would matter to them. Um, maybe it's making a phone call or an email. Um, it really just depends on where you're at because I think uh, we have lots of people here uh, at different, different parts of the process, uh, different comfort levels and different stages. So if you're willing to, to, to jot down your next step in the chat, that would be wonderful. If not, we'll survive. 
<laughs> and uh, I, I do want to emphasize one point that Michelle just brought up about time and the time it takes to build a relationship. Um, again, let me just draw from sort of personal history. I started out as a volunteer, met with many groups who had either never heard of ranked choice voting or were actively averse to it just because they had so many different issues that they were caring about. We started building a relationship and now a lot of those groups are today part of the coalition. So you look at that time frame, and it's around six to nine months in many cases. It requires patience and it requires really cultivating those personal relationships. And that's where all of you come in. It's sort of a critical thing where we can't really lose patience. And many times I'll send an email and I don't get a response. And two weeks later, I follow up or I, uh, you know, set up a Zoom call or I go to an event that where I think there'll be very interesting people and I connect with them separately offline. There's sort of many ways to look about finding different organizations and trying to meet new people. And that's how you sort of go about explaining the work. So let's look at some of the examples of folks who are already part of uh, the coalition. And before I do that, I see Stoney put something in the chat. Let me just uh, uh, read that as a, as a goal and next step. Uh, Stoney says, I've been intending to contact the York Neighborhood Association for some time, but waiting in the hope that it could be done in person. That seems increasingly less likely in the short term. So I'll just see if I can join one of their online meetings. It's a great idea, Stoney. I think uh, waiting for in-person can take a while. There's no, there's no reason to wait at all. And I think that's a perfect strategy. I'd love to connect with you offline and see how we can go, go about doing that as well. Um, so let's take a look at who's part of the Washington for Equitable Representation Coalition. Well, uh, one of our stellar members is the Urban League of Metropolitan Seattle. I'll let you read the quote on, their, on your own time. But uh, what I will say is how did I connect with them? I connected with them because I was invited by a gentleman by the name of Kamau Chege, who runs the Washington Census Alliance. It's a coalition of more than 100 plus organizations that uh, take funding from the state to drive up uh, participation in the census. Critical work, we're in 2020, census year, uh, which almost we can forget sometimes. So they invited us to basically do a quick presentation and they were looking now to think about their longer term projects. After the census is over, how do we focus on redistricting? How do we focus on equitable representation? That's where I gave a short presentation and uh, a woman by the name of Maya Manus basically connected with me and we uh, connected offline and went from there. Uh, and who knew, you know, the Urban League is a group that I hadn't even reached out to on my own, but it was one call, one presentation, and it sort of went from there. Let's look at another example. Mustafa Muhammad Ali, who's from the Islamic Center of Olympia. Uh, Lisa and I had actually gone to, and I think, Michelle, can you go to the next slide? I don't know if it's progressed on my end. Oh, did we lose Michelle? Not sure if we lost Michelle. Oh, there we go. Michelle, are you back? Awesome. Let's uh, let me let me try and share my screen quickly just for these. Sorry about that, folks. Okay, uh, Mustafa Muhammad Ali, who's the social secretary of the Islamic Center of Olympia. Again, I love his quote, so clear. I love to learn about it, think about it, support it. How did I meet him? Well, uh, Lisa, Colin, and I were in Olympia doing a presentation to the, um, to the, it was a work session for the Elections, Government, and Tribal Relations Committee in the Senate. Uh, and basically we were presented to talk about ranked choice voting and cumulative voting. So we were doing that and it turns out that in an adjacent room somewhere else, Mustafa was hearing this presentation, found it super interesting, came up to us outside as we were heading to our cars and said, you know what, come talk to my congregation tomorrow. I really want them to hear about this. Uh, I think it's a great idea. I loved hearing what you had to say. So the very next day, we drove all the way back to Olympia and went to the Islamic Center of Olympia where they were hosting a, a community um, and we're talking about just, it was sort of a community conversation and we got a good five, 10 minutes to talk to different community members about what ranked choice voting is and how it improves equitable representation. So that's another just great example of, you know, never knowing when you will connect with folks and it could be the right moment at the right time. Another example, this is a legislator. Uh, Senator Joe Wen is a strong supporter of ranked choice voting. He's one of our advocates in the Senate. Uh, he's also part of several different coalitions like the Partners in Change Coalition. I see him every week on that coalition call. That's a coalition that was set up very uh, in a time sensitive way to fight for more COVID funding. So he comes on every week and he talks about you know, what is it that he's fighting for in the Senate? How, what's his position on a series of bills that are important to coalition members? So it's just to highlight that even legislators could be part of a coalition in the sense that they could come in and speak and advise folks on sort of the best ways to move forward. That's it, folks. This is, uh, this is the, sort of our recipe for coalition building. So I wanna stop there and I wanna see if uh, there's any questions from the audience. 
uh, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask us. Thank you so much for listening. So that was very helpful in Thanks. my opinion. Sure. Do you have a question? Uh, no immediate questions. Um, one of the helpful things about it was prompting me to think of organizations that I uh, either already have intended to get in touch with or not and thought of new ones. Yeah, I th I thought so too. I think when Michelle and I sat together and we like broke that down in in such a in such a granular level, uh, Michelle's an educator, and I think that's what I appreciate a lot about her because she's able to, to to take this process and sort of break it down for us. And I know Lisa, when she first participated in it as well, uh, mentioned that she thought about organizations she had never even considered before. Same thing happened with me as well. That's why it can really help uh, to to sort of break it down in that way. Um, Carol says, you've been to many places I have, and the best thing I can do is expand my network beyond first year. That's great, great idea. And I see that Trenton has a question. Trenton, ask away. What's your question? Yeah. I was just gonna ask if you saw um, a strategy of having multiple people reach out to a single organization is a good strategy, or if that can be feel a little bit like pestering um, for, for a new organization specifically, if maybe you've tried, but you're not getting any kind of response from yeah. them. Yeah, I, that is such a fantastic question. Thank you for that. Um, I will say, here, here's what I think about that. I think if you're thinking about reaching out, I would love to first touch base with you because maybe you, you're not aware we have reached out before. So I think just touching base and developing a strategy together would help. In some cases, I think that could be helpful because let's say there's an individual who's part of the organization. This is an, especially with labor unions. If you have us, our supporter, who's a union member, the ask coming from them, even if it's come multiple times from other Fair Vote Washington folks, could hold a lot more weight. And in that case, you know, you reaching out would really, really help and maybe it might be best coming from you. But before you do that, it would be great to touch base to see who else has reached out. Uh, the same thing with, you know, Washington Education Association. Colin and I and, and Lisa connected with their lobbyist. So this is kind of, if you think top down, we're looking, you know, high level, who's working to move policy from the Washington Education Association. At the same time, we're like, wait a second, uh, from our 6,000 plus supporters around the country, there's a lot of educators, including Michelle. So let's form a working group. Let's see how we can get these educators together. Let's see what the local affiliates of the Washington Education Association are and have them make an ask to the association, have them say, let's use ranked choice voting internally, and then move that to uh, the different um, sort of lobbyist level uh, policy priorities. I hope that answers your question. I think both can be effective and it's great to touch base about what strategy to pursue. Perfect. Thank you so much for